uh, perfect for winter winter veggies. So we'll be looking at that. So um, so hopefully by the end of today, I'll tell you what you uh, are likely to learn. Um, so everyone should be able to develop a list of plants that they they can grow right now. So plant right now. Um, we'll be doing a thing called uh, no dig gardening. So if you're starting a garden from scratch, this is a technique that you can you can just go bang, put some things down, and away you go. Um, so we'll, we'll look at the soil ecosystem again. You'll be able to list the benefits of a healthy soil ecosystem. Um, we'll bring it back to a few key principles for managing healthy soil. Uh, a healthy soil ecosystem. Uh, we'll show you how to, how to build a no-dig garden. And then um, we've got a whole bunch of plants here that we're going to lay out and, and just talk about how you can lay, you know, design your veggie garden uh, so you get the, the best veggies, the most nutritious, healthy, disease-free, pest-free, um, amazing organic permaculture styles veggies. So um, yeah, let's, let's crack on. Um, we've got a screen share. So, so it's what to grow in winter in Sydney. Um, there's lots and lots of information online. It's always good to just refer to the internet for this sort of stuff. But there's a good resource that I think Julian's going to pop up on your screens, which is a, the Organic Gardener magazine, uh, a really good resource for any organic gardening kind of tips and ideas. They have produced um, two kind of calendar, well, charts um, for Australia that shows you different areas of Australia, what you can plant in the different seasons. So that should be on your screen right now. So we're in July, so you can go down the July um, column. Uh, and is color coded for different areas of Australia. So uh, I think it's blue is warm. They've, they've classified Sydney as warm temperate. So if you just go down the July column, uh, look at the things that are you have the blue, blue square, then they're, they're the good things to grow now. Yep. Purple, sorry, purple square. Um, all right, so I've got a list here. Um, I don't want to spend too long on this because this is pretty easy to figure out. Okay, so, um, and this is certainly not a comprehensive list, but I'll just, artichokes, broad beans, broccoli, cabbage, uh, celery, celeriac, chives, coriander, endive, English spinach, and I'll, you don't want me to read the list. You can look it up yourself. It's much more interesting. So um, there's actually lots of things that you can grow in Sydney in winter. Um, and there are probably lots of things not on that list that you can grow as well. So. Other good resources I would recommend are Green Harvest, um, Green Patch Seeds. We've probably mentioned all these before. They're the online seed sellers and they have lots of information about what you can grow in which season in which area of Australia. But today we've got, I've got a whole range of um, seedlings here. I've kind of cheated and gone to the nursery and got them. Um, you could grow them from seed as well, but we've got lots of cabbages um, and I'll show you these things a bit later. Unfortunately, I put this bucket out in my backyard last night and I forgot it was there and I let my chickens out and they've kind of, I kind of had a, had a bit of a feast, but that's okay. So we'll have some healthy chickens and the, the plant will still be fine. It'll go okay. All right. So um, any questions about that? Does anyone? These were just the big hardware store that everyone goes to, to buy stuff. Uh, they're, they're, hey? Yeah, they're, yeah, they're, and look, you know, the downside of doing that is, the, you know, they're probably grown using chemicals. You, don't, you know, there's a whole range of inputs into these that we may not necessarily support. The far better way is to have your own little propagation area, buy seeds from organic seed suppliers, grow your own using the potting mix that you know is organic and safe and, and rich and healthy and feeding them things that you'd like to feed. But for the purposes of an exercise like this, it's, we're not quite there yet. So yeah, this is what I do. <laughs> but, um, you know. Yeah, yes. So Helen, Helen asked the question, we're getting a propagating shed put in at the garden here up near the, the, the existing shed. It's, it's very exciting. So we'll, we'll, we've, we've started saving seeds. We've got an awesome group here who are saving seeds from the garden. We'll be able to grow them on in our propagating area and make sure they grow really well, put them back in the garden, save them, and we'll, we'll have that closed cycle. So next time we run a workshop like this, we'll have actual seedlings from, from the garden. Yeah, so, um, so watch this space. We had a, 
we had a, uh, a guy here today giving us a quote to, to build that. So yeah, hopefully, I don't know, a couple of months, spring, two months, three months, soon. All right. Now, um, so you go, you, you, spend, you spend a lot of time nurturing your seedlings or you go to the shops and buy them. Um, but you want to create in your garden the best possible conditions for these plants to grow. Um, and, and those of you who have done some of these workshops, this is kind of revision and hopefully this will all bring it all together just as a whole kind of, kind of thing. So we've talked about soil, we've talked about pests, we've talked about other things around that. And this is all kind of putting it together in, in one place. Um, so soil, it all comes, comes down to soil. Um, we're going to use this little patch of garden here. And just bear with me for a second. So this three hours ago was, um, it was a garden full of sweet potatoes. And we've harvested the sweet potatoes, the perma bees. We've got a couple of buckets fulls of tubers, um, beautiful fat sweet potatoes. And now we've got a slightly disturbed soil ecosystem that we can um, we can use for planting out our next our next annual annual veggie garden. So I just got a question for you guys. Um, and hopefully feel free to shout out in the, you guys or you, you guys. Um, what do plants need to grow? So sun, soil, water, nutrients, sun, soil, water, nutrients. Air is another thing. And they're the main ones. I'm just checking my list. I do know this, but I just want to make sure I don't forget anything. Um, I've got down here also protection from pests and diseases and protection from wind. Um, so we've got, we've got <laughs> so we've got protection from wind here, which is cool. Um, so pretty much all of those things can be provided to your plants from your soil. Okay, so the only thing that is not provided by the soil is the sun and protection from wind. But nutrients, water, air, and interestingly, protection from pests and diseases can be achieved through building a healthy soil ecosystem. Um, and that's, that's the thing that just blows my mind. Like the soil actually provides everything that your plants need and it's the life in the soil that provides everything your plants need. There's really complex relationships going on there um you may have heard the story about nitrogen fixing plants legumes that grow with a pod and they have a, a relationship with a bacteria in the soil and the bacteria captures nitrogen out of the soil air and makes it available for plants to grow apparently 90 percent of, of land plants do the same thing so it's not just legumes so all plants have a relationship with bacteria, fungi, soil organisms. The plant provides food for the organisms, the organisms provide food for the plant in return. So it's a really, it's actually, we're just starting to learn this stuff. Humans are touching the surface. So really complex. Um, so that's a real key. So it's all about that soil life and feeding the soil life and the bird life as well. Um, so it's a two-way street. The plants feed the soil organisms, the organisms look after the soil. The organisms also protect the plant from pests. So when a plant is getting eaten by something, it sends a signal, a chemical signal, and then the soil organisms respond in turn and send up um, uh, chemicals that protect the plant from that pest, which is just amazing. And the same for diseases. So there's a lot going on. We don't understand it, but it's beautiful. It's been you know, there's 500 million years of evolution going on here. Um, we've only been around for a few thousand years, so maybe we can just nurture that process and, and step back and let it happen. Um, so the soil organisms, they make nutrients available to the plants when they need it. They decompose organic matter and turn it into humus. Uh, they bind soil particles together. Uh, with, this has been fairly mashed, but we'll... Got a digger here. Let's see if we can find some soil particles. So see when we do that, see how that kind of clumps together? That's, um, that's what we call structure. 
So it's the, uh, the organisms that make humus and they exude all sorts of sticky gooey stuff and it binds the soil together in structure. And one of these pieces of soil, it's got air, it's got moisture, it's got nutrients, it's got everything your plant needs. So, um, so that happens. Uh, they aerate the soil, worms going up and down, they do aeration for us. Uh, it allows water, so a healthy soil ecosystem allows water to soak in and get held in the soil. Um, and as I said, protects, protects uh, plants from pests and diseases. So it's complex, but we can break it down to really, really simple principles of how to look after your soil. Um, what are they? <laughs> yeah, no digging. So every time you dig, um, you're destroying, it, it, it's like driving a bulldozer through a building. It just trashes the, the soil structure. It, 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 it destroys the soil. So don't dig. Yep, put mulch on the top. So add a diverse range of organic matter and the decomposing organisms will turn that into beautiful soil. And there's one more thing. No chemicals. So often it's what you don't do, which is as important as what you do do. So be careful what you add. Um, there's one other thing that is kind of not something that springs to mind often straight away with what... I don't know, any, you guys who were here in the first week, I think it was the first week when we, yeah, so pH is a measure of the acidity. So that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this process um, of, so, so you've got, when you add mulch and the organic matter, the organisms come up and they break it down. And, um, <laughs> This, this is why we ask people to keep their dogs on leash. Yeah. Um, so, so you know, you've re we talked about replicating a rainforest. Plants grow, they fall down, the leaves fall on the surface. These organisms, they're bacteria, fungi, all sorts of worms, they eat that um, organic matter, they turn it into humus and it builds healthy soil. So that's a really important part of building healthy soil. There's another, another way that there's another mechanism for, for building healthy soil and putting, yeah, diversity <laughs> is absolutely one of the key principles and diversity of plants. So living plants um, through the process of photosynthesis, they actually, they call it liquid carbon. They, they're constantly pumping carbon and other nutrients into the ground and feeding the soil organisms in the ground. So about 30% on average of a plant's energy that it makes from the sun gets put into the ground to feed the organisms and it is it's in there and it's stable and it stays in there so it's actually sucking carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it into the ground so your little veggie garden out the backyard that if you manage your soil well following these simple principles you're actually helping to do your bit for climate change right you're sucking carbon out of the atmosphere and sticking it into the ground where it belongs so the more of us who are doing this um, will have that benefit and also your plants um, will be awesome. They're more nutritious, they're healthier, they're more disease resistant. So, so there's two processes, that decomposition and the constant uh, photosynthesis pumping energy into the ground. That's really important. So um, the principles are always keep a diverse range of plants, always add a diverse range of organic matter, um, don't dig or disturb the soil. And uh, I've got, remember, <laughs> Plants don't need us. We, we tend to just do more do damage, right? Just leave it alone. Let nature do its thing. We don't need to be always interfering because more often than not, we're a, we're a problem. So, um, <laughs> we are, we're really, yeah. I guess, what are really tangible examples of that is self sanction Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like here we have forests of parsley that are the healthiest and most amazing looking parsley. And I don't know, we, we have, don't really do anything. So, so it's, but understanding those natural cycles and replicating them, and that's really what permaculture is about. It's understanding how nature does things really well and just just managing so that, so that we allow those, those really good things to happen. Okay, so let's, um, let's put that into practice here on our newly dug uh, sweet potato bed. Sometimes you've got to dig if you want to harvest stuff. So we, we've done that. 
Um, has anyone made a no-dig garden or heard of no-dig gardening? Yes, 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 everybody. Okay, well, that's it. We can go. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that was good. Um, it's a really simple process. I think I've previously somewhere I've mentioned, there's, you know, there's lots of different places that are doing this commercially and getting really good results, really good productivity. Um, there's a place called Singing Frogs Farm, really worth checking out. They, they, they do this process, but I've been doing this for years and once you do it, you'll never dig again. It really works really well. So it's just a case of replicating that soil ecosystem. So. Um, oh. <laughs> uh. Yeah, that's right. That's another reason I don't want to do really stand up. Um, all right. So, what do we do here? So, okay. So you can build a no dig garden anywhere. You can build it. We could build a no dig garden on that concrete over there. We could build it on this path. We could build it on the tennis court. Um, it's basically a case of layering. Uh, layering organic matter on, on top of the ground and then planting into it. So here, because we've got an existing cleared area, we can just go straight on top of the soil. If we were doing it over there where there's mulch, I'd just go straight on top of the mulch. So it's just something you do on straight on top of an existing surface. Um, and let's do it. So what have we got? Now. Um, so we could probably just throw some mulch down here and plant straight into it. And it would, I think it would go well because we've had years and years of composting here. But I'm not going to not share this with you um, because it's too good. <laughs> so Helen, who's with us here, she's been looking after our, our worm farms and this is freshly dug out of the worm farm worm castings and it is just awesome. It is so good. So. So we can add some of this to the top of our soil. And what we're doing, well, what are we doing by adding this, this beautiful material? Yeah, we're adding nutrients. There's lots of nutrients in there. What else are we, what else are we adding? We're adding water holding capacity. That's correct, Helen, thank you. Structure, yes, you can see there's, lots, there's good structure there. So there's lots of um, broken down organic matter, which will provide structure. Bacteria and fungi. Yeah, bacteria and fungi. So this is just full of that soil life that we we're talking about. So by putting it uh, a layer of this, we're, we're kickstarting that soil ecosystem. Um, so let's do that. I'll just do this little section. I'll let the guys here finish it off. So you don't need heaps. I would probably, I don't know, that's probably enough. Do you want me to do it? Oh, okay. So we're just um, we're seeding our seeding our soil with our organisms and our nutrients and our water holding capacity. Uh, you might see some critters in there. I'm not sure. Hopefully there'll be some some worm eggs. Um, so that would be more than enough. What I'm also going to add because it's all about diversity. So lots of diverse different materials. There'll be lots of diversity in that mix. Um, but we're going to add a bit more diverse material. Um, this is just chicken poo, I think, with seaweed. There you go, it's got a bit of seaweed in it. So um, it's a pelletized manure and seaweed mix. You can get these that have uh, blood and bone, seaweed, fish, and a real diverse range. And they're really good just to put a little bit, you don't need much, just a little bit. And what that does, that also feeds your microorganism, it feeds your soil ecosystem. So all that diverse range of food there for them. This is um, some blood and bone, which is literally dead animals. Just a little bit of that, that'll invite other microorganisms to come and feed in the garden. Okay, so just a little bit of a scattering of, of a few different things. You don't want to overdo it. Um, because we're not really feeding the plants, we're feeding the soil. Yeah, so if we, I shouldn't do that one, stand up. If, no, it's okay. If we, um, 
yeah, why? What could be a problem with, well, um, yeah, so there's, so if you put too much nutrients or if you're, if you're constantly kind of liquid feeding your plants, I'll throw it out there, knowing what you know, what do you think could be a potential, there's probably some positive sides to that for sure. There could be some negative sides. What do you, what do you think? Yeah, so Barb's saying they could become reliant, the plants can become reliant on you providing that food for them. How does that happen? Like, how do they become reliant on you rather than not? What's the process? They gorge on the application. Yeah, yeah, kind of, sort of. So, particularly liquid food, they can take it up, kind of force feeding them, and it it's not doesn't create healthy plants. But there's another thing that happens. Julian's dying to. Can you go through? Um, well, I guess it was in the session that I was doing, wasn't it, where we we're saying there's a link between the uh, the plant roots and the soil in the, uh, soil bacteria and fungi. And so the bacteria and the fungi are feeding the plants. And if you fertilize or over fertilize, then it breaks that link. There's no longer any need for the plants to give any food to the bacteria and the fungi because they're getting it from us. The problem is that bacteria and the fungi make a really big difference to all the life in the soil. So fertilizers break the link and then it has all those downstream effects. Yes. Uh, but I'm just saying it as a point. Uh, but I would be interested how. Oh, I would have come there. Sorry, guys. <laughs> right, I'm not. Sorry, I'm not entitled. <laughs> but uh, I would be interesting how permaculture looks at this. For example, when I studied, they said the studies I did said too much fertilizer can increase salinity in the soil, which can then become toxic for the plants, and it can also uh, it can also alter pH where it would become too alkaline and therefore not very good for the plants. Is that also like, would you like agree with it or is there any link from permaculture point of view? Yeah, um, yeah, certainly. I, I think permaculture is, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's it. Sort of when you start adding things, you, you can have problems, you know, it changes the soil structure, changes the soil chemistry, uh, can lead to problems. So, from a permaculture perspective, um, kind of one of the principles of permaculture is um, what is it? Minimum input for maximum yield. So I think they, you know, the permaculture kind of talks to all of this stuff in in its principles. So you know, you don't want to be keep adding inputs, inputs, inputs. Um, you put a little bit in maybe if you need to for the right reason and then you you get the maximum yield so permaculture i think the idea is that it shifts from that dependency to more of a set up the system to look after itself kind of process so um is that i don't know <laughs> um but yeah it's uh, this this amazing kind of connection between the soil and the and the organism and the plants feed the organism the organisms do everything that the plant needs i heard this read this really good kind of way that helped me kind of wrap my head around it was we we have we have our stomachs in our stomachs we have bacteria the bacteria we put food in our gobs the bacteria in our stomachs breaks it down we have an internal um, digestive system plants have an external digestive system Okay, so they have the same relationship as we do, but it's outside them, it's not internal. So they, they rely on the soil organisms as their digestive system to provide them everything that they need to be healthy. So I really love that way of looking at it. So it's, um, yeah, so what we're doing here, we're adding organisms, we're adding a bit of nutrients, we're adding diversity, we're adding food for our fungi, bacteria, and all those other gazillion kind of critters that are gonna live in the soil. And we just put them on the top and, and let them be. Um, do we just leave it like that? Why not? Why not? No? <laughs> Why not? That's a question. Why not? <laughs> yeah, now, like, so, so you, you know, you can put compost or worm castings on the top. What's going to happen if we leave this for too much longer? 
yes, it'll die. So effectively, the nutrients will still be there to a degree. They'll start to off gas, but so we need to cover this over just like a just like a normal uh, functioning ecosystem where plants grow and they fall on the surface. Um, so that's step one of no dig. Step two is put some sort of mulch over the top. You can you can go and buy mulch, which is okay if you don't have any. Um, Sugarcane mulch, lucerne, really good. Um, this morning in our perma bees, we were just kind of pottering around, harvesting stuff, and you know, yeah. Well, so this is um, we took a few. We've basically mulched up a few different plants. So I just wanted to show you these. So this one uh, is mulched up comfrey. So comfrey is this guy here. Um, and comfrey is a really important part of this food forest for cycling nutrients and for improving the soil. So these guys have a really deep tap root that goes way down into the, into the ground and brings nutrients into the leaves. So the leaves um, are naturally very rich in, in trace elements and all sorts of things. So it's a really good plant for improving soil. So if your garden's big enough, you, know, you might have your veggie garden here, but everywhere else you can put things like comfrey that will, will help improve soil and you can just chop and drop them. So this is our mulch. It costs us um, nothing. So we've saved money, full of nutrients and the worms and the critters will absolutely love it. So it's really, uh, you can put it on before or after. It doesn't really matter. I find it easier to put the mulch down and then plant into it rather than putting the plants in and mulching around. It's, but it's a personal preference. It doesn't really matter. So that's comfrey. We've got some pigeon pea, which is, um, which is a shrub. It's a legume, so it should have lots of nitrogen. This one's looking a bit, a bit sad. It doesn't have, it's missing something. Yeah. And those of you who are here for the, what is my plant lacking workshop, you would, instantly know what it's lacking here <laughs> but it's it's um i think it's a dying so it doesn't matter but it's beautiful beautiful mulch so these these just grow around the place there's one just there uh it's a shrub they normally live for not very long three or four years you get these beautiful flowers the bees love them they produce pods with little um seeds in them like they're like lentils uh, was it? Did you, did you make the curry? Helen's made the curry in the past using chickpea, uh, sorry, um, pigeon pea seeds. It's delicious. Pigeon pea, pea as in pigeon. So we'll throw a bit of that down as well. So this is really fast tracking the natural process of plants growing and decaying. We're feeding all our our um, decomposing organisms. We've got here. Does anyone recognize that? Yes, yeah, related to peas, so it's another another legume. Um, you can buy this as a mulch. You can buy it in big bales. You feed it to horses and cows and guinea pigs. It's, yeah, lucerne. So this is lucerne, and we're actually growing lucerne in the garden here. So we've got a whole bunch of lucerne plants, and just regularly we'll let them grow up, and then we chop them and drop them. So this. I couldn't find any in the shops today. I think it's really hard to get at the moment, but we've got, so don't tell anyone. So lucerne, it's, um, it's really good because it's, it's a bit like the comfrey. It's got a very deep tap root. Uh, it's good at bringing nutrients up. It's a legume, so it should have lots of nitrogen in it. And this, you know, we've got some, some green leafy bits and we've got some brown dry bits as well. So there's a nice balance of, these have lots of nitrogen in it and this has lots of carbon. So it's a nice, it's just a really good mulch, really nutritious and your soil, um, it just responds really well to this stuff. So I'll chuck a bit of that. We got one more thing, just because we can. Um, arrowroot. So we've got lots of arrowroot growing here. It's hardy, it's unkillable, it's a good windbreak. Um, it just produces tons of organic matter. So we just, we just chuck that around as a mulch as well. There you go. That's it. That's no dig gardening complex. <laughs> so if you look, if you're interested in building a no dig garden from scratch, um, again, look it up on online. Um, you, if you're doing it on grass or on weeds, you can do a layer of newspaper at the beginning. 
a thick, solid layer of newspaper, wet newspaper, straight over the top of your weeds or your grass, and that, that stops them from growing. And then you go up from there. So if you're doing it in that context, you might just keep adding layers and layers and layers and layers and compost, worm casting, different material till it's about 30 centimeters thick, and you can plant straight into that. We don't need to go so thick because our soil already is quite quite good. So we're just topping up the existing soil. So that's um that's prime growing for our little little seeds and seedlings. I haven't really. It's about now when we do a breakout room. I haven't really got anything. Um, yeah, let's stop for some questions. Yep. Oh wow! So we've only got twenty minutes. Okay. Any questions? Yep. Yep. So the yep. Um, so the question was, can you use weeds as as a mulch? Um, and the answer is yes. And uh, Julia was pointing out as long as there's no no seeds in it, so you wouldn't you wouldn't pick a you know a weed that's got lots of seeds because you'll have a weed garden. Um, and you'll learn some weeds actually grow from pieces as well, but you'll learn which weeds are okay and which ones aren't. Weeds are great; often got lots of nutrients, lots of trace elements in them, so you can use those. The other thing you can do with weeds, and we may do a workshop on this sometime, is make weed tea, put them in a in a bin, and put the lid on, fill it with water, and they just rot down and sort of throw that around. Yeah, the so weeds are actually, eh? yeah. Um, I love the idea of letting it go, let the nature do their thing, because that's the, probably the best way. However, because I'm involved in the seed library groups, if you want to practice crop rotation, um, how does it then interplay between let it do your thing, because then the next season you might want to plant different crop in the same area. So would you still let everything just... I don't know, like self seed, or would you collect it to free up the space? I just see there's a little bit of like a friction between these two. I don't know. Like what do you yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it's a good question because it all depends. Depends what you want to achieve. So I think if you're, so you mentioned a few, so seed saving um, and crop rotation. So it's a really good segue into the next bit. So we'll do that and then see if if I've answered your question. Um, so so what the key concept, and you will read this everywhere, is diversity, 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 and then some diversity. So when you're planting out a garden, um, I'll show you the plants I've got and the reasons why I've chosen these ones just quickly. So these are chives. Chives are on the list. These are all on the list of things to grow at this time of year. Chives are great. They're a herb. They smell. Fragrance helps with pest management. Um, scent masking chives. This poor half eaten fellow is an amazing um, ca uh, cauliflower. Yeah. Um, I've tried, I tried to choose all heirloom varieties from, from, the, from the nursery. So old fashioned varieties that you may not necessarily find in chives, but I just, I chose this because it just looks absolutely beautiful. So they're kind of flowering, but leafy greens, cabbagey in the cabbage family. Uh, celery, this time of year. Um, celery is a leafy green. So you can start putting your plants into different categories and this is leading into kind of that thinking of crop rotation. So crop rotation, you might you divide plants up depending on their characteristics. Coriander is great in winter in Sydney. It's probably the only time we can really grow coriander in Sydney because it just bolts to seed as soon as it gets warm. Uh, that's a herb as well, smell. Uh, spinach. English spinach, uh, that's another leafy green. I'll go, I'll go a little bit quickly. Uh, heirloom cabbages, little cabbages. So we're getting a, winters, cabbages, broccolis, all your, your brassicas tend to be winter. Uh, lettuces. And more broccoli. <laughs> this is a purple heirloom variety. Yeah, yeah, I think you can, yeah. No reason why you couldn't. Chickens certainly do. Enjoyed it. 
Uh, kale. Kale's a, a ripper. Really easy to grow. Um, fast growing. Another leafy green. Uh, artichokes. These are probably not what we'll put in our veggie garden because they get enormous. Uh, but now's the time to be planting your artichokes uh, and hopefully you get spring food in spring. Uh, whoops. What do we got? Beetroot. Beetroot. We can put that in a root vegetable zone. Uh, onions. I don't know. Are they herbs? Smelly. Smelly things. We'll put them in smelly things category. We've got rainbow chard, which is silver beet, which is a really good one to grow in Sydney. Really easy to grow. Um, so that's our leafy, stacked with leafy greens, aren't we? Uh, and flowers. Always include some flowers in your veggie garden because these guys will attract beneficial insects that help with pest management. <laughs> so flowers. Um, oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is the other so this is my little seed collection fun little thing that I pull out from time to time uh, winter peas peas are um, our winter legumes so anything with a pod is a legume and the legume does that thing with the nitrogen in the soil so these are sugar snap peas which are awesome we'll throw some of those in uh, broad beans good time for broad beans as well if you wanted to, to get some broad beans that's another legume so we've got legumes, root crops, flowers, herbs, leafy greens. The other thing that we, the other group is flowering, um, sorry, fruiting plants. You don't tend to get fruiting plants in, summer, in winter. So crop rotation, we would have all our leafy greens in one bed, all our herbs in one bed, all our root crops in one bed, and we just move them around. The more the permaculture, more, well, the method that um, replicates nature a bit more is just to mix things all up. So we're creating a guild. So, so we talked about herbs being smelly. So they can help to, to mask the scent, say, of your kale. So a lot of your pests will find the kale by smell. They put those together and they've got a symbiotic relationship. So they, that helps this with pest management. Throw in some flowers. We've got some uh, ladybugs and some hoverflies will come and they'll eat the aphids that come and land on your on your kale as well so so rather than separating everything out put them all in together and you get some really interesting uh, ecosystem dynamics happening and you get a much more stable stable garden stable system and your plants will be much stronger for it that's a really quick version of what a guild kind of is you could also throw in some legumes into the mix so what these guys do is put nitrogen into the soil Leafy greens need lots of nitrogen, so there's another connection there. Um, your peas tend to grow up tall, so you'd need some sort of structure for your peas. Um, so in winter, when the sun's coming low to the north, you'd put your tall things on the south side of the garden so it doesn't shade everything up. Um, that's some of the thinking behind planting. Um, any questions from me, please? No, no, okay. Zoomers? Any Zoomers? I can't hear it. I'm not hearing anything. I don't know if anyone's talking They're or... Very quiet. Yeah. Lisa? Yeah. Yeah. Would, would people like to see, just I guess transitioning to the next section, but would people like to see I can easily get that. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, we kind of rushed through laying out. So, there's a whole other level of laying out the garden, um, which you probably need another little while for. But, assuming we're mixing things all in together, uh, planting in little, little groups of plants, so maybe three something three flowers here, three root crops here, three something else here. We'll plant some, some of these alyssum. So we've decided we're going to put, we'll put one there, we'll put one there, and maybe we'll put one there. So nice and close together. And they'll grow into each other. Now there's about... Uh, 
question. Yes. How do you know? Um, well, one way to decide is you look at the label and the label will tell you, this label is telling me to space them 10 centimeters apart. So that's pretty close actually. That's even closer than that. I wouldn't actually plant them that close because these grow into a little clump like that. Um, so yeah, you need to decide how big the plant is going to grow horizontally. Um, yeah, and then space them accordingly. I always plant closer than it tells you, not normally, except in this case. Um, you know, I'm a stuff as many plants as you can in kind of person because you can always eat them if there's too many. Okay? Um, and the closer they are, you want to cover that whole surface area and get maximum photosynthesis happening. Um, okay, so you, you lay out, the first thing you do is decide where everything's going. We'll have a little clump of alyssum here. So there's about 12, 12 six plants in here. So to get them out of the punnet, put your fingers over the soil, turn it upside down, give it a bit of a squeeze, a bit of a jiggle, and it should pop out like that. So I don't know if you can see all the little fine roots, very um, little feet of roots, delicate. So turn them up the other way, and then, you want to carefully, you can normally see the rows that they're planted in, just care as carefully as you can, just divide them like that. And there's still two clumps of plants, then we divide them again, like that. And you're always going to rip some roots, but you want to rip as few as possible. Now we've still got, I think there's two plants in there planted right next to each other. I'm not going to divide them because I'll probably do more damage. And we may end up with two non plants. So I'm just going to plant them in together and they'll, they'll grow that. The other thing you could do is, is just break one of them off, keep the strongest one and plant one. Or you could, and you could very carefully divide them again, but um, I'm just going to do that. And then you just dig a hole where you want it to go. Now, the hole only needs to be as big as, as that root ball. So I'll probably, I'll just get my digger. I'll just dig that down like that, just soften it up. Just dig the hole about that size, drop it in and just backfill. Just gently, you don't want to squish it in. Um, and you only backfill to the top of the soil in the, um, uh, on your plant root there. So, so when you're backfilling, you only backfill level with that. So you don't put soil around the stem. You put so soil. It's, um... Yes. <laughs> um, here. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you only only backfill to there. If you put soil around the stem, uh, more often than not, your plant will fail because the stem needs to be out of the ground. If you put it in the ground, they can rot and die. So, so just backfill like that. So this little guy, um, and we'll just tuck it in with a little bit of mulch. Again, you want airflow around it, so not too much mulch around it. Um, and give it a drink, which I've got here. So, water that in. And what you can do at this stage, if you really want to, um, is you could put some liquid seaweed. Uh, I think Kat's got a good recipe for making liquid seaweed. Um, or and or some some sort of fish chopped up fish or fish uh, fertilizer and, and what that does the seaweed and the fish it's it, again it stimulates the uh, microorganisms as much as it as feeding the plant so it's provides some more nutrients just to kick start the plant it'll stimulate the root growth of your little seedling um they get they get a thing called uh, what they call transplant shock. So your, your little seedlings just gone, you know, it's had roots ripped apart, it's chucked in the ground, it's out in the middle of the field, it's 
bit shot. So this will just help settle it in, promote new growth, um, and the seaweed and the fish, micronutrient uh, microorganisms, they go crazy. So that's kind of it. And then you plant the whole thing, water it in, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and just you know, and then. I don't know. We'll we'll watch this. We'll watch this garden over time, and the perma bees can be looking after it, and we'll be uh, yeah. So we'll finish planting it out today, and if you're on Zoom, come along and check it out sometime. Uh, I think we're. Oh, thank you. So seed planting. Um, look. Uh, okay. So some seeds, you can plant straight in the ground, and they grow really well. So these are broad beans. They're they're really big seeds. Generally, the bigger seeds are easier in the ground direct. Smaller seeds, you often you might be better off sticking them in a like a punnet in a, in a propagation area. They're a little bit harder, um, and I'm sure there's a proper technique to do this. But I found that this way this way works really well. You decide where they're going, uh, and just say we've chosen it's going here. Spread the mulch, uh, and one thing you could do is make up some, a batch of seed raising mix using coconut fiber and sand and a few other things and put a nice seed raising bed or for your broad beans. Another thing you can just like, you literally just push it in and cover it over. It should grow. <laughs> but they're pretty, you know, they're seeds. Um, I'm sure I'll, I'm sure there's another way, I don't know. Horticulturist, is there another way to plant seeds? That's kind of really all that you want to, yeah. They say, yeah, as you said, they say in a big mix with very high uh, drainage. Yeah. And, and very little or no nutrients. Yeah, okay. Because the seeds are supposed to have all the nutrients in them. Yeah. That's what they say, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you can you can make a mix with the, that drains really well and doesn't have much nutrients, and then the seed grows, and then the root goes down and finds the nutrients, and away it goes. So I think with peas and beans, particularly if they get too wet, they can go rotten. So so we'll see how we go. We've got sandy soil here. So oh yeah, yep. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. I'm just forgetting. So so give it a drink. Um, the rule of thumb with peas and beans is only water them once and then just leave them. So they'll soak up enough water to, to get to germination with one watering. If you keep watering, they can go rotten. So, so I'm getting the wind up for the zoomers. So um, if if we can, we've got a couple of minutes. Um, I always like to go around at one of the workshop and just if you can, um, if you guys could share just one thing that you remember, um one at a time and that's just we'll start with the with the online guys so does anyone want to have a... hello stop digging hello stop <laughs> digging <laughs> good advice all right thank you lisa um yeah so um overuse of fertilizer that that breaks breaks the link that's not yeah, that's new to me. So that's that was interesting. Yeah, cool. So Lisa said the overusing fertilizer that breaks the link between the plant and the organisms is, was interesting to her. Is it? That's it. Yep. Okay. Well, thanks, guys, for um for listening in, and um yeah, go and do a no dig garden somewhere. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> we will do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next time. <laughs>